Good afternoon, friends. I, Rakhi Sharma, welcome you all in this interactive teleconferencing program of Advanced Certificate in Power Distribution Management. Friends, it's our privilege to have Professor Arun Kanda from IIT Delhi. In this session, he will talk about the project implementation. Now, I would request Professor Kanda to take up his presentation. Thank you, Rakhi. Thank you very much. Well, in the first session this morning that I had with you, I was talking primarily about uh, the generation of a detailed project report, which is a very important document talking about how the project is selected, what is the market appraisal, the technical appraisal, the financial appraisal, the ecological appraisal, so that on the basis of this you would have a project which you would then be able to implement. Now obviously the purpose of making that report is that you will judge whether the project is worthwhile. And if it is worthwhile, then you should implement the project. So now in this particular session, we will talk about implementation and the implementability of the project in terms of this. Now let us look at, for instance, the various uh, phases in the life cycle of a project. Any project will generally go through these four major phases. The first is the selection of the project which we were talking about in the last lecture. Once the project is selected, based on the detailed project report, the next stage is project planning, which will consist of defining the scope of work, the development of the project network, then development of the basic schedules, that is identifying which tasks have to be done, when do they have to be done, that is basic scheduling. And for this, you use techniques like PERT and CPM, which will answer these questions and will give you a chart of when which activity is to be done. And there are a lot of computer packages which help us to do this exercise for large projects. So you must not be overawed by computer packages. They only tell us this basic scheduling aspect generally. You know, MS Project and uh, Prima Vera, these are the two commonly used computer packages for this purpose. And, but they give you basic scheduling. So after you have done basic scheduling, the next aspect in project planning is to do time cost trade-offs. Time cost trade-offs refers to the, that particular phase in which each activity in a project can be invested with more or less funds so as to vary its duration. For instance, if you are talking about digging a channel from this place, say 20 feet from here, then this channel could be dug either in two days or in 10 days, depending upon the extent of manpower, the extent of money that you are willing to spend. So the point is that activities or jobs are compressible in terms of the time and cost. That means the more money you spend, the lesser the time and vice versa. So to take these kinds of considerations, we have what is known as time cost trade-offs. And uh, time cost trade-offs in projects, which is also known as time compression, or uh, it's also known as determination of the Pareto optimal frontier in project management. So those kinds of considerations are involved in the time cost trade-offs when we are talking about the project planning phase. And then we have resource considerations in projects. Resource considerations typically talk about allocation of manpower. You see, the one typical problem in projects is that all activities are not based at the same pace. You are doing some activities now, some other activities later, and so on. So your requirement of manpower is generally not uniform. Similarly, requirement of machines is also not uniform. You have peak loads and you have uh, slack periods. So how to deal with resources during peak periods, how to handle resources during slack periods is the problem in resource management in projects. So when we talk about project planning as a discipline, we are addressing ourselves to some of these issues. And once this is done, that is once we have been able to plan a project on the basis of its scope, the network development, the basic schedule, the time cost trade-off, and the resource considerations, we get a feasible plan for implementation. And that plan for implementation is what the project manager has ultimately. And he has to implement that project and come out with flying colors, as it were, 
to be able to say that yes this project is now complete i mean at least this is the one that he has to do and project implementation is the art and the practice of implementing that plan you see you might have a plan for your day but doing it well is part of implementation so we will see that project implementation involves certain techniques certain human behavioral aspects and it's not necessarily true that what you planned out to do will come out true so all those difficulties come up at project implementation and once the project is implemented you have completion of the project and audit so these are the typical phases so in this particular lecture i shall be talking about i presume that the project planning has been done the detail and we'll take up a project for implementation and inherently we'll have a look at how the exercise is done for a particular project incidentally there is a technique known as pert cost which was developed by the department of defense and nasa in 1962 way back for construction projects and also for uh, the development of the polaris missile during those projects uh, this technique the basis of project uh, development is this particular method and the key concept used is that costs are to be measured and controlled primarily on a project basis rather than according to a functional organization of a firm and the activities or groups of activities are micro cost centers these are the concepts let's not go too much into detail we'll illustrate this through a small uh, example you see one of the assumptions that is made in this practical project management technique is that the responsibility for expenditure should coincide with the responsibility for managing the activities that give rise to the expenditure now this is a very simple concept actually the concept is that normally on the field a man can sanction let us say at most 500 rupees whereas he is responsible for an activity which might be costing 50000 rupees so if he wants more money he has to run to his boss who is maybe in the head office somewhere and not at site and get all these sanctions and so on so he wastes a lot of time doing that what the network cost accounting system says is that if a person is to be entrusted with a task which is worth 50000 rupees empower him to take the 50000 rupees whenever as when he feels like rather than making him run every time to the head office for few sanctions and so on because that is causing administrative delays and other kinds of penalties in the project now to some extent the private organizations tend to implement this but uh, in many bureaucratic structures this may not be possible so but if we do this it would considerably i mean this is the uh, basic assumption in the network cost accounting system and it seems strange that one who sanctions the expenditure has nothing to do with activity implementation and actual cost control have you not seen that a youngster who joins a company very enthusiastically on a project he does lot of work and he certainly expects more money he has to run to his boss and the boss is busy with his meeting he doesn't even even meet him for two days uh because he is busy elsewhere attending parties and doing something else so that's not the way the project i mean that way the projects will get delayed and you are sort of trying to crush the enthusiasm of the individual by getting into this kind of culture so the culture ought to be it seems strange that is the genesis of this statement that one who sanctions the expenditure has nothing to do with activity implementation and actual cost control he has sanctioned the process once and that's the end of it and he doesn't even care to find out what is happening whereas people who are doing the project are running around facing all the difficulties and so on so to overcome some of those problems we have this per cost system that we are talking about now in order to implement this notion of a project we have the notion of what they call a work package what is a work package a total project is divided into work packages in various ways that is the project may be divided into work packages in various ways where a division in too many small activities may detailed may give you detailed planning and scheduling whereas a division into large chunks will deprive the project of detail and is not conducive to effective monitoring and control right 
So, which, which is a very intuitive concept. It says, if I have to do something for a day, right, what do you do typically? If I have to do, say, 20 tasks in the day, what would you do? You would tend to make a list, say, I have to go to the hospital, I have to get medicines, I have to get uh, something for my wife, I have to do this. You can list down the various activities. So what have you done? The total task for the day has been broken down into smaller tasks. In fact, each of those smaller tasks can be called a work package or an activity. And basically, what is a project? A project is a collection of activities. And this collection has precedence relationships. That is why it can be represented as a network. So a project network is a representation of the various tasks in a project which are represented on a network. And uh, this is the basic notion of a work package. Now let us see how do you divide the project into tasks. Obviously you should divide the project into convenient packages. What does convenience mean? It means that for each work package which is assigned, there should be a person or an agency responsible. Right? It's like saying, for instance, let's look at it. See, the metro development is taking place in Delhi these days. So they have divided into large number of tasks. First thing is making the plans, is one major task. And a large number of agencies like rights and others are PRTS are involved in that activity. So one could be developing the layout plan. Next could be you take up one of these activities like digging a tunnel, digging the tunnels. Now digging a tunnel from Connaught Place to Chandni Chowk could be another activity. Digging a tunnel from Connaught Place to something else could be another activity. That means each of these individual tasks could be divided into various other subtasks which are responsible for this activity. So the point that we are trying to emphasize is that the overall project, you will get an idea of the overall project only when the project is composed of different number of activities which are mutually distinct and together complete the entire picture like a jigsaw puzzle. So, But this individual jigsaws will be handled by different individuals and different agencies and ultimately they will put it together so that the project becomes full, right? Now, the point that is being emphasized here is that each piece should be neither too big nor too small and the responsibility should be clearly defined, identified and uh, still small enough and manageable for planning and control purposes. These are some guidelines for defining your work packages. Some of the assumptions that are made in project management need to be understood because they are inherently made and by not understanding them, we sometimes make mistakes. And they are not explicitly stated in textbooks also sometimes. It is generally assumed in PERT cost that the expenditure on a work package is uniform throughout its duration. What does this mean? If an activity costs 100 rupees, let us say, or 1000 rupees for uh, understanding, and suppose it lasts for 10 days, that it means that we are on the average spending 100 rupees every day. So the assumption that is being made in PERT cost for accounting purposes is that if 1000 rupees is to be spent on an activity, we are assuming that 100 rupees per day is being spent every day, which may not be true. Isn't it? But for con convenience of calculation and for convenience of accounting, we'll assume that. And it may be reasonable as the number of activities are included. This is generally true because you have large number of activities. So the averaging effect takes place. And if this is not reasonable, then your cost structure will be something of this type which is shown in this diagram. Because what will happen is in the initial phase you might have to pay large sums of money. Why? Because you pay advances. Then as the work progresses you pay less money per day. And then towards the end you have to clear bills so you pay a lot of money. So the pattern of expenditure could be of this nature rather than uniform. But that is not a problem. 
For purposes of accounting, you can replace this activity by three activities in series. And uh, you can imagine that the activity, the first one, the second one and the third one are in series and the pattern of expenditure in each is uniform for purposes of calculation. So this is only for understanding. For instance, if the actual nature of spending is what is shown in the curved curve, the nature of spending could be assumed like this. Monthly expenses in the beginning could be high because you have to pay the advances. During the operational phase, it could be minimum, which is the second phase. And during the last phase, it could be again high because you have to clear the bills. So typically, that would be the way in which you spend the money. Now, let's take an example of a project because you are dealing with, you are in the construction management. Let's take a construction project or any project for that matter. Any project would be a network. And this is an example of a network that we are taking. You notice that this is an activity on arc network. That means the arcs are representing the activities. And the two numbers adjacent to the activities are the duration in months and the cost in thousands of rupees. For instance, activity 5-6, which is an, a job in the project, requires three months and costs 75,000 rupees. Right? Similar figures are available for each of the activities in the project. Now, I presume that you are all familiar with how to do basic scheduling, that is forward pass, backward pass, and knowing basically the critical path in the network, right? That means finding out the total duration of the project and when it would be possible to complete all the activities. So I can do a forward pass and a backward pass. But before I do that, I do one thing. I have done a forward pass and a backward pass, and that way I can get the early start and the late start of the activity, which is shown in this slide called basic scheduling. You can notice the first column is the activity. The second column is the duration, which is given to us. The early start ES and the late start are what are computed as per the standard forward pass, backward pass algorithms with which you are familiar with, I presume, and which is uh, one of the basic things which you do in project management. And the total cost for the activity is given to us for each activity. For instance, activity 1, 2, the first activity, costs 40,000 rupees. So since it has a duration of two months, 40,000 by 2 is 20. That is the last column. That is cost per month. As I was mentioning, we are assuming that the cost per month will be approximately constant. So the last column, which is cost per month, is computed like this. And the figures indicate the total cost per month for each of the activities, which can be calculated. Now let's see what we do with this data. That is the interesting part. This project, by virtue of the uh, forward pass and the backward pass calculations, has a total duration of 12 months. And what I have drawn here is the early start schedule of the project. The early start schedule of the project is shown here, where you find that the critical path is 1, 2, 4, 6, 8 these activities. And these activities are there because there is no slack. Because if you delay any of these activities, the project gets delayed beyond 12 months. Right? But you notice one interesting thing. On the dotted lines, for instance, activity 2, 5, 5, 6. 5, 6 can be delayed by 1, 2, 3, 4 days. And still the project can be done within 12 months. So basically, activities 2, 5, and 5, 6 have a total float, as we call it, of four days. And similarly, activity 3, 6, it can be finished at time 6, but it can be extended during period 7, 8, 9, or 10. It won't affect the duration. So it also has a total float of four days. However, activities 7, 8 can be extended at most by two days 
because then it will merge into node 8 and the project will be delayed. So the point really is that this is a schedule in which there are certain activities which can be, which have certain slack. That means they can slide back and forth without delaying the project. And there are some activities which must be done as per the time schedule. The activities which must be done as per the time schedule are called critical activities. And the critical path in this particular example is 1, 2, 4, 6 and 8. And the numbers that are adjacent to each arc are the cost per month which I had computed in the last slide. Go back to the last slide. The numbers in the last column refer to the cost per month. So those very numbers are shown adjacent to each activity. Now if you just do a summation period by period, simple addition, what do you find? You find that in the first period, activity 1, 2 and activity 1, 3 are going on. So what is my expenditure? 20,000 per month is the expenditure on activity 1, 2 and 25,000 per month is the expenditure on activity 1, 3. So the total expenditure going on in the first month as per this schedule is 45. In the next month it is also 45. But in the third month what happens? There are a number of other activities which are on. So activity 2, 5 is going on, activity 2, 4 is going on, activity 3, 6 is going on, activity 3, 7 is going on. And the total cost is 30 plus 15 plus 20, plus 20, which is 85. So the first row at the bottom of this line, uh, diagram shows how the monthly expenditure in thousands of rupees will go. And what you are seeing is the expenditure in every month is fluctuating. This is it. Right? You get an idea. The manager must know how much money he is going to spend each month. So this is that useful information for this schedule. Now obviously this particular thing and then the cumulative is shown here. That means the cumulative column, the cumulative row at the end of this particular table shows how much money, for instance, up to the end of the sixth month, the total amount of money that has been spent is 420,000 rupees. The total by the end of the ninth month is 535,000 rupees. So this is the total expenditure spent on the project because the manager must keep track of this information. And this is what the budgeted cost is. The budgeted cost and value is computed in this way. Now you understand very well that budgets are made but seldom are we able to stick to them. So there will be an actual cost and then there will be a, this is our budgeted cost. So a comparison of the budgeted cost and the actual cost will give us the overruns and the underruns and the departures. And on that basis, we will try to monitor the project. So this is the uh, essential feature that is there in project implementation and management. Now, the important thing also to understand is that the pattern of spending that we have got depends upon the schedule, the early start schedule, because certain acti all the activities are scheduled as early as possible, will try to shell out money as early as possible. But if we delay activities 2, 5 and 5, 6 and similarly 3, 6 and 7, 8, what will happen? Some of the spending, instead of being done earlier, will have to, will can be done later. And you know, those of you who have understood uh, financial management will understand that late spending is always better than early spending. Why? Because the net present value is always lower. So you have to take a lesser loan from the bank to do the whole thing. So there is an advantage from the financial point of view if instead of an early start, we do a late start. So this is a late start schedule. This is the same schedule. The project is done in 12 months. But now what we have done is, instead of the activities being done at the earliest start, we have scheduled the slacks in the beginning possible. So now what has happened is, although we could have started activity 2, 5 at the time 2, we have started it at the time 7. And the dotted line is now preceding rather than succeeding the whole thing. 
So if you calculate the total expenditure for this case, which is now the row corresponding to cost, obviously the cumulative cost will remain the same, 615,000. It's only the manner in which it is changing, right? It's like saying, I have to give 100 rupees to my son. I can give him 0, 100 or 100, 0, which means I give him either 100 rupees at the end of the month or 100 rupees right in the beginning of the month. But I have to give 100 rupees for the project. So obviously giving 100 rupees at the end of the month is better because if I take a loan from the bank, I can probably get that loan for 95 rupees and pay him 100 rupees. And that means I could get a uh, get my lesser loan I'll have to take, right? The NPV will be smaller. So the same logic works here. So the question that may be asked is, which is a better schedule? Do we take a late start schedule? Or do we take an early start schedule? And for purposes of project implementation, which one is better? Now, can you answer that question? First thing is you compare the two schedules. An early start schedule will always have a cumulative cost at any point of time, which is higher than that for a late start schedule, which is as shown in this particular diagram. The cumulative costs are always higher. That is why the NPVs are higher. But in a country like India, what is the disadvantage of a late start schedule? You see, a late start schedule implies that all your materials and activities take place exactly on time. If there is a delay, then you had it. Had it what? Had it in the sense that you will not be able to complete the project on time and it will not be possible to handle any uncertainties of that. That means Basically, the late start schedule is good where a just-in-time culture, reliability, and Six Sigma, and these kinds of things are applicable. So under the Japanese context, perhaps this would be very good because if all your vendors are reliable, he says, I'll supply you the parts at 6 a.m. and he supplies them at 6 a.m., then the late start schedule will be a reliable schedule and you can work on it and you can reduce your inventories and work with it. But if you have unreliable vendors, he says I'll supply at 6 o'clock, you have no buffers. So the disadvantage of a late start schedule is that you have no buffers. But if you have uncertainties in the system, you require buffers. And the early start schedule provides you those buffers. So this tells you the price. So the greater the degree of uncertainty that you have, the better to start with early start schedules so that you can absorb the uncertainties. So basically, the difference in the NPV between the early start and the late start schedules is, uh, you can say, the price you are pacing for the uncertainties and the buffers that you keep, right? So you can decide. If you feel that you are somewhere in between, then you can have a schedule which is neither early start nor late start. Somewhere in between, if you feel like, and calculate the cost schedule in the same manner. Now, coming to the aspect of, now we have chosen a schedule. I have told you how from a project network, that means we first defined the work packages. From the work packages, we developed a project network. From the project network, we developed a project schedule. From the schedule, we identified the costs and all that. And then we know the pattern of expenditure. From this, now we have to implement the project. How do we implement the project? Basically, the project is to be monitored. That means as the project progresses, you have to talk about project monitoring. Project monitoring is generally done with reference to three parameters. The performance of the project, the time that the project has taken, and the cost that it has taken. Performance means you must ensure that the activities that you had set out to achieve are being done as per the required specifications. So how will that be done? You must ensure that you have put the right vendors, your workmen are doing the proper jobs, you have given the right kind of drawings and they are following the right kind of drawings. So that is performance as per quality specifications. And that is something that must go on all the time. You must have skilled workers, trained workers who will do the job that will take care of your performance aspects. Why is it that one company charges a much higher uh, 
rate of interest or uh, why does one company charge you more money for doing the same job than another company it's primarily because of its credibility and the skilled operators that it has so performance you pay a cost but then you must make sure that performance is proper that is you have people who are skilled people who are doing the job say in the assembly of a car by a maruti plant they do standard dies they use proper materials they use proper workmanship the people are trained in japan etc so they are following certain processes for doing that the same car could be made outside in jama masjid maybe by a set of vendors by uh, irregular uh, welding etc but obviously that would not be standard performance so performance refers to with reference to the specified quality norms you are talking about monitoring the project next thing about the project is the time how much time have you taken that means suppose you were supposed to complete these activities by uh, say january the 15th and you find that by february the 15th you have not finished even half of them or you have not even finished one third of them then you are definitely lacking behind in terms of time and the third thing is the cost that means how much money should you have spent on the activities and how much you are actually spending these are the three crucial pillars on which your project monitoring depends so how do we go about doing this for these three indicators of project progress that is performance time and cost there has to be a common reference for purposes of measurement and control you see whenever you compare anything you have to compare it on the basis of a reference and what is the reference in this case this common reference in the project is the original plan or the budgeted cost and value curve i showed you those curves which we had drawn early start schedule late start schedule and the cumulative cost curve that becomes the budgeted cost and value curve on the basis of which you plan that means we'll say we'd like to follow this and then monitor with regard to that whether you are following it or not that's all so choose a it's like saying choose a plan measure departures from the plan as you go along and those departures will tell you whether you are on time or whether you are on schedule and as far as project pro, uh, the performance is concerned that is a continuous monitoring process where you are making each activity as per the specifications so this is how uh, quality control checks are made in projects how it is done uh, in terms of uh, the project is we define what are known as abc curves the a curve is a solid curve shown in this diagram it's the budgeted cost curve so it's the is the middle is the curve that you see in solid lines Uh, which is uh, something like this this curve here solid line curve this is the cumulative cost curve which we have calculated then so this is the this curve here this one this curve is the one that we have plotted there in the early if you have chosen an early start schedule this will be an early start curve if you have chosen the late start schedule it will be late start curve or whichever schedule you have chosen this will be the uh, corresponding a budgeted cost schedule now suppose that we are here today that means the project has been going on and uh, let me say that i monitor the project after 3 months so i am here today and let us say on this day today according to this curve this is point a point a is the value of work that should have been completed and i am at this time today now suppose that the actual cost spent on the uh, cost spent till date is so much which is small b and the what is small b is like saying that as per the plan i should have spent 100 rupees today but my total expenditure when i find from the records on the project is let us say 120 rupees so it is higher than this point 
So can I say that there is a cost overrun? No, you cannot say from here, from these two curves. Why? Because what happens is that with 20 rupee, with the 100 rupees, you don't know how much work has been done. So what you need to find out is the value of work completed, right? Because what may have happened is that you have 100 rupees to spend. With 100 rupees, you might have done worth work, uh, work worth uh, only about 80 rupees. So what happens is, 100 rupees ka to uska original budgeted tha. 120 rupees is what I have spent. But when I check up, the worth of the work done is only 80 rupees. So what does it mean? 120 rupees you have spent for doing work which is worth only 80 rupees. So the cost overrun will be 120 minus 80. And uh, divided by C, the value of work is this. So in general, the cost overrun can be defined as B minus C which is in the numerator divided by C. So a negative value indicates an underrun for this. So this would be a mathematical formula that you can use for the cost overrun at any point once you have these three points. All that you need to calculate is these three points. This is given to you, A, which is the reference. What you need to know is the actual cost incurred at this point of time and the budgeted cost or the actual work done here. Now, how will you calculate the actual work done? That is very simple. Uh, similarly, what will happen is, let's talk about the time delay before we go to the example. In the time delay, you are here. Suppose you are at this point today. Now, this value of work according to this particular line, what do you see? You see, you brought down this line here, so this becomes the value of work done today. If I draw at this point a horizontal line here, and cut this solid line here, this particular point. What do you get? This particular figure, this particular figure will be saying that this amount of work should have been done here. This amount of work should have been done here. So this horizontal distance will actually represent the fact that jo kaam mera aaj ho raha hai, it should have been done let us say in the month of January. So this horizontal distance will measure the horizontal distance between the curves C and A. So basically you can see it's a very simple process. I mean I've just explained to you the whole thing. A is the budgeted cost schedule. You collect data for the actual cost and the value of work. That is actual cost is this dotted line and actual value of work is this dotted line. And the time overrun is this horizontal distance. So only distance, uh, cost overrun is B minus C by C and the horizontal distance represents the time. So now you can uh, call this information. There is an alternative nomenclature for these things which is known as uh, budgeted cost of work scheduled which is the A curve. Actual cost of work performed is the cost curve and the budgeted cost of work performed is called the budgeted cost of value performed. So we have a project management association, international project management association that has given a certain terminology to these three curves A, B and C respectively. This is A, this is B and this is C. The three curves that I just explained. So you can calculate a cost performance index and a scheduled performance index. I don't think we have to go into details of these because they only mention. Yeah, Professor Kanda, what is uh, turnkey contracts and unit rate contracts? Could you please highlight yeah. these? Turnkey contracts are those products in which the project uh, as a whole is considered. Right? Turnkey means that you have a project which requires, for instance, work packages of different nature. For instance, uh, in a metro project, let's yeah. take the example. You would have a job of tunneling. You would have a job of getting the railway uh, wagons. You would have the job of designing something. So if you are negotiating one big company which will do all these jobs for you, it's a turnkey project. That means it would handle not just the individual components, but the turnkey 
in that sense. So turnkey means one agency which is responsible for performing all the functions together. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you talk about individual projects, it could be talking about uh, specialized sub-projects in a project. Uh, unit, it's just unit rate um, contracts? Yeah, uh, it could be. No, unit rate is different. Yeah, unit okay. rate would mean when you have fixed up the scale of operations on a project, you are talking in terms of identifying uh, the rate for each project. For this is like this, that you have an overall project to do. You can divide it into smaller parts and give the individual parts to different agencies who are working, get the uh, invite separate quotations for each of them and get the working done and then compile the whole project on that basis. That is uh, one way of doing it where you, it is your responsibility to break up the project into smaller components and yeah. get it done individually yeah. and uh, that's a unit rate project in that sense. Okay. But if you want to do it on a turnkey basis, yes. then the entire project would be handled down as a responsibility to one particular agency which you can uh, negotiate fully and they will do the entire thing and do it for you. So what is the advantage of the turnkey contracts uh, with, the, with uh, this unit rate contract? The un advantage is obvious. The advantage in turnkey projects is that you don't have the headache of dealing with coordination and control of individual jobs. It is like trying to say you organize a wedding and you get an organi a wedding organized in a hotel. What is the difference? When you do an, uh, organize a wedding yourself, you have to get the uh, food done, you get the food drinks done, you got to get the flower decorations, it's all your responsibility. So what you are doing is each of these jobs you have broken up and you are handling them individually and you are making sure or you can assign responsibilities to different people. So that becomes uh, like trying to say individual people are responsible and you are handling this. The other thing is if you do it in a hotel, yeah. you have outsourced it. So the, all the activities which you are doing, somebody else is doing. That's a turnkey project. Okay. Whereas if you handle everything individually, individually means even through agents, it's a unit rate operation. Okay. That's the difference. So um, now the time is very short. We okay. Have, yeah, we have so only I one think minute. we should have some questions at this stage. My uh, simple example, I mean, I would uh, skip some of these slides and just uh, simply summarize yeah. uh, what I have said. Uh, all that I would like to say is that uh, in the first session today, we talked about the very important aspect of project identification and appraisal. So if you have any questions on that, those are also welcome. And then in the second session, we were talking about the process of project planning and subsequently project uh, implementation. Now, project management is the combination of all these uh, activities together. As I had uh, mentioned to you, these are the various activities in uh, project management. So, Essentially, project management is composed of project selection, project planning, project implementation, and project audit. So, so if you have yeah. any questions, you're welcome. So we can uh, now. I'm sure that this interesting lecture by the Professor Kanda would help you in, in immense learning and the functioning. And I express my gratitude to Professor Arun Kanda for spending valuable time with us and uh, sharing. Uh, a lot of uh, information and, 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 and enlighten us on various aspects of the project development and implementation. Thank you, Professor Ganda. Thank you. Thank so, you. friends, we'll again be in discussion after 15 minutes on financial management. Thank you.